Hi everyone, it's Vanessa. I'm here today to chat with you about the things that I read in the month of January. I read nine things in the month of January. Wait, I'm missing one. I read 10 things because I haven't done one more little drawing there. So the first thing that I read is Other Words for Home by Jasmine Warga. This is a book in verse. It's a middle grade book. It's about a Syrian girl who moves to the United States um, as a refugee. Um, she stays with her uncle who has immigrated many, many years prior. So he's very Americanized at this point and her American aunt and cousin and she comes over with her mom. It's just all about that transition. Um, what I really enjoyed about this was the audiobook experience. Listening to a verse book and audiobook is always a good way for me to consume a story like that. It was very poetic and very uh, beautiful and sweet and very just compassionate about these issues and talking about immigration. If you're into any of that, I recommend it. It just got the Newberry Honor um, at the Youth Media Awards at ALA Midwinter, so I liked it. The next book that I read is Turtle in Paradise, and this is one of our books for the program that I'm doing this year. I tried to read all of them. I basically read all of them except like three, so seven out of the ten. Um, and Turtle in Paradise is a Jennifer L. Holm book. This is maybe my third book or fourth book by Jennifer L. Holm at this point. Um, she's a very fun middle grade author that I, I enjoy. She writes a lot of historical fiction. This one is set in 1930s Key West. Um, I've read another book by her that's also set in 1930s Key West and that's kind of where her family's from so she kind of she knows the culture and she really weaves a lot of history into her books for kids that are set in Key West in the 1930s and I really like that as well. The end always has like a bunch of information that pulls specific things from the text as like real things that were happening in the 1930s. And it follows Turtle who is our main character um, and she's basically shipped off to live with extended family uh, in Key West while her mom works um, at a home and they don't allow children there and her mom is kind of continuing a relationship with a man as well. And so she's kind of shipped away and it's all about her adventures with her cousins and them trying to get to know her but also not wanting a girl to be in their like gang. So it's just a very nice down-to-earth kind of good characters, strong-willed characters. It has a nice message at the end and it does have kind of like a what kind of ending that I feel like children might not be quite ready for yet. It ends kind of sad which is interesting that that was the choice Jennifer L. Holm made for that book. The next book that I finished was also another audiobook and this is American Royals. American Royals is kind of a hyped book on booktube I feel like. I've heard a few people talk about it and it follows like a alternate universe United States where we have royalty, um, we still have a monarchy, and we have a king who is kind of faltering in his health and his daughter who is the oldest is the one that's going to take over his spot basically. It follows three different stories of the daughter, the son, and um, the daughter and son's best friend slash girlfriend. Um, so it follows those three like kids who grew up together under the shadow of all of this and how all of their stories kind of intermingle. Um, there's literally so much angst and there's also so much like uh, unrequited love and like star-crossed lovers kind of a vibe for all three stories um, which could get a little bit tedious and kind of boring after a while. I cared so much more about like the setup of the monarchy and like what that means for the country and how that all works more than I cared about like will they or won't they be together like I didn't care that much about the romance. I kind of like the the world and the politics more in, in that. And that's the same with Red, White, and Royal Blue. I didn't care that much about the romance. I just cared about like these two people who live in these two very specific um, demanding of expectations kind of worlds and what happens when they kind of collide. So I like more of the background stuff than I do about like the relationships between them. I feel like it was a little bit too long. Um, I think it's like 13 or 14 hours on audiobook. If you're looking for something very, very light and something with lots of lots of drama, I would recommend it. The next book that I read and I'll talk about the first two volumes in that series, I have um, volume three out right now. So I read volume one and two of this series called Fence. This is by C.S. Pacat and Johanna the Mad and Joanna La Fuente. The first three volumes are just 12 issues of following this comic book series of these boys in this competition to kind of get the top spot um, in this fencing program at this college and it's kind of like the cutthroat atmosphere of all of that. Um, volume one and volume two I would recommend that you get 
all three at once because I read the first one and automatically had to put the second one on hold. They all end in cliffhangers it seems like and it makes you want to keep reading. It's just because they're so short too and so easy and fast to read. They're so compelling um, that you just want to learn more about the characters and you want to be in that world more. So now I'm going to read volume three and the sad part is that is that we will not have another volume or compendium or anything like that until later this year when like an original graphic novel of this kind is going to come out which is a good and bad thing bad thing that we have to wait good thing that basically they're going to be focusing on developing the boys in the series and the relationships and the fencing world so much more so we're going to get bigger chunks of kind of plot and and uh book than we've been getting with these comic book series but I have to wait which kind of makes me want to wait a little bit longer to read this one just because I'm scared it's going to end in a cliffhanger as well and I'm going to want to read more. Yeah very very addicting. I had heard so much about this over the years and I just hadn't come across reading it yet um, and then I finally did after I saw Whitney Novels, Whitney at Whitney Novels talk about it one more time on her channel. It's a very very fun series and I totally recommend it. The next thing that I read is No Visible Bruises. This is the first nonfiction book that I read in 2020. I started it last year and it really took me a long time to finish it mostly because of the setup of the book. It has very very, it's a very long book and it has so much text on every page there's like no indenting, there's no like real margins um, to kind of make you feel like that momentum and I feel like that's really important in a book and this one did not have that. Like it was 230 pages but if they had changed like the dimensions and the way that the book was set up it could have been, it could have made me feel like I wanted to read it more. You spent a lot of time on one single page. Um, it got to the point that I was really searching for the audiobook and I was going everywhere, like every single library system I'm a part of. And sadly, it's only available on Audible, like their audio originals, which is kind of dumb, by the way. I still don't understand, like, what is the upside of getting an Audible account other than the fact that some of these books are not available anywhere else because Amazon has literally said it's all mine. Um, yeah, I don't want to pay $15 a month to listen to one audiobook when I can listen to it from the library. But sadly, Amazon had a grip on this audiobook and I could only listen to it from Amazon. I found a way to get one single credit for free, which is really nice. So that's how I finished listening to like the last six hours of this audiobook. Again, a pretty long audiobook. I like this book. I don't think it's perfect. Some parts of it, it's like it wants to be a, a very narrative driven tale, which I like for the, the fact that it makes you want to continue reading the story. But I also think that there aren't really any answers here or any suggestions. I think it was more about like seeing what different groups are doing to deal with domestic violence. This is a book all about domestic violence and how that affects our society. And it starts off with a story, a really devastating story of a husband who killed his wife and his kids, how they got together and kind of all the signs that people should have been looking out for but did not. And then um, that happened in the 90s. And so it's looking at how nowadays different uh, institutions and organizations organizations have like ways to track domestic violence and to kind of guesstimate when something fatal might happen. The reasoning for people not leaving, what police are doing as a result of it as well. It also has a whole section where they talk to people who commit um, familicide or infanticide or kill their wives. It was difficult to listen to those parts because the people who commit these crimes are really really sick and it's kind of difficult to understand how you're supposed to help in that situation. So a tough read. I don't think I've ever read a book about domestic violence so I'm glad that I read it and I wish that more books come out that are a little bit more in depth or have more solutions and suggestions as to what we should do as a society to kind of better those statistics. In the next book I do have a the copy of it still and I read Waves um, by Ingrid Shebert and Carole Morel. This is a graphic memoir. This is what it looks like inside and under some color areas as well and it follows a couple who is trying to get pregnant and the person who is carrying the child is having a very difficult time carrying it to full term and suffers a few miscarriages as a result and grapples with what that makes her feel like um, as well as what her partner feels too. It's from the author's real life so this happened to her and this is kind of her little story. It's a very very short graphic memoir and I feel like a lot of it 
is about the the feelings and less about like the discussions putting metaphors to what that loss and feeling of grief is like and it has to do a lot with water and waves and sailing as you can see from the cover i wish it was longer i wish it was more in depth um i feel like the author only wanted to tell a little bit of a snippet and that's totally understandable this is her own personal story but it did seem like i finished it in 20 minutes and it kind of went in one ear and out the other and it didn't have that emotional kind of oomph that I, I would have expected from a story as kind of traumatic and sad as this. If you're looking for something kind of short, quick, um, to the point, I would recommend it. Okay, I talked about Fence Volume 2 and then the one I finished after that is also a graphic memoir but this one is told in essays. This is Hot Comb by Ebony Flowers. I talked about this during my vlogmas videos as a book that the NPR concierge basically recommended to me. So this is kind of what the art looks like. It is kind of blocky, um, black and white only. There's no color. And they're just short stories about being black, the experience of getting your hair done or how people look at it. Um, and it comes from Ebony Flower's own life and experiences. I felt like this essay collection was a bit hard to decipher. The way she draws too in some points you're kind of having difficulty understanding what it is we're supposed to be looking at or paying attention to. Some stories I really understood kind of the point. Some stories were so short that I was like what? I don't really understand what we're getting at. My favorite story in this one was one about her sister. It is called, let me find it, My Little Sister Lena and it's about her sister and her peers, her white peers in this kind of like softball baseball group and her peers kind of looking at her hair so much and wanting to touch it and obviously you're not supposed to be doing that. How that really affects her sister's way of thinking about her own identity um, and it leads her to have kind of some hair pulling coping mechanisms because of it. So some kind of like trichotillomania sort of aspects to the story which made it really like powerful and showed you kind of like how people could internalize being othered like that so much so i really valued that story this is coming from someone who does not have black hair who is not black so this collection is not for me this is just what i felt um, when I read it, so that's my own personal opinion. I reread Get Aside on audiobook. It's a book that I really, really loved the first time I read it, maybe three years ago, two years ago? I think three years ago. This is my first time listening to the audiobook, and it follows a detective who is trying to make clearance rates go up in South Central Los Angeles. He works in an area where there are a lot of homicides, and the clearance rates are very, very low, and that causes a lot of distrust between the community and the police, and basically what the author is arguing here is like clearance rates are very important to create that trust and that bond between community and police because a lot of people in that area feel kind of like they have to take it into their own hands to avenge murders and to kind of bring justice because obviously police and detectives are not doing that for them. It's a very fascinating story. I feel like I got less out of it the second time, especially on audiobook. Maybe there's just a lot of characters and too many things going on that my ears could not comprehend as well as my eyes comprehended the first time around. So I ended up bumping my rating from 5 to 4. But I still think it's a very good book to listen to or to read if you haven't read it. And the last book that I finished, I finished Little Women! I'm not going to carry this huge generous thing because it is very, very heavy. <laughs> I checked out the annotated version and then I listened to it and I kind of went back and forth between listening and reading as well as reading a lot of the little notes um, in the annotated version there's a little annotation for a lot of things to give you some kind of history background and to also mention a lot about Lisa Mae Alcott's and her whole family's lives and careers which I found very very fascinating. I didn't know how much um, Lisa Mae Alcott's life mirrored Little Women and like her sisters. Obviously I, I feel like I didn't really know anything about Little Women before reading this and I really did end up enjoying my experience of it. I still need to go watch the movie. That's kind of like what started this whole thing. I wanted to watch the movie because I love Greta Gerwig but I wanted to read the book first. I loved all the sisters. I love Jo in particular. Of course, she's so fun to read about. And while I did feel like it was very moralistic, and that's the whole point, uh, especially from like the time period it was written in and like the purposes for like her publisher wanting her to write this, I totally get it. But I still found it like very cozy and sweet to listen to and to read. It made me happy. And then there was one part was like, 
this is where it switches from just like moralistic lessons to being a full-fledged novel and then things started really happening. I don't know if I'm like 100% happy with like how it all turned out but it was still very fun to get to know all of the sisters and where they all ended up. I've taken two quizzes now and apparently I'm Beth slash a Joe Beth mix so that's great. <laughs> I am really glad. I've read a classic this year. What? I don't think I read any classics last year. So that's pretty much it. Those are all the books that I read in January. I hope that you enjoyed watching this video. Um, if you've read any of these or would like to read any of these, let me know in the comments and I'll see you in my next video. Bye-bye.